I want to talk to you about blockchain and I want to explain to you why this whole issue is so important and why the blockchain is solving the trust problem. We start with the big question, which is what is the fundamental problem in business? And at the heart of everything we do, the big problem is trust. Because until we can know, like, and trust somebody, we can't do business with them. Trust is absolutely at the core of business. I have to trust you in order to, tra to transact with you. It's the fundamental currency of commerce. And if you think about everything we do, trust is baked into the core of it. It is, if you like, the beating heart of capitalism. Now, in order to uh, manage trust in the modern economy, in the late 20th, early 21st century economy, we need centralised intermediaries to stand in what is called the trust gap. Because if I meet you, um, I don't automatically trust you. But I need banks and governments and corporations who can stand as intermediaries and to help um, manage that relationship between us so that we can have confidence that the transaction will part, uh, take place. Now, the old joke is I'm from the government and you can trust me or I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Both are laughable. Both are absolute nonsense. Uh, but nonetheless, we rely on these corporations because it's the best solution that we've got. And there's still a gap, but you have to sort of work with it. The big issue is that we don't really know who we're dealing with. We don't really know if we can trust them. So we rely on people standing in the middle to perform that important central role, to manage the transaction. They provide visibility into the transaction through asset tracking. They help to identify parties in the transaction, creating trust. They perform business functions, clearing and settling transactions, enabling me to put money on the table and you to put your asset on the table. They do the exchange and then we, we pass and we know that we won't lose our money and we'll get the asset because there's somebody standing in the middle managing the transaction. They keep records that can be validated and they, there is opportunity then to recourse if something goes wrong in the transaction. It all hinges around trust and it's all managed by central intermediaries. Now today, the problem is that even with all these central intermediaries um, and you can record these transactions, you have these central ledgers and you have these asset ledgers and everything, these can still be changed. They can still be altered. They can even be deleted after the event. People can add extra records or they can tamper with existing ones. So even with all this, there is still a trust gap and it's still an issue which people have to live with and manage. So when you do a transaction with somebody, particularly if you're doing, let's say, a corporate transaction or an M&A transaction, yes, you have to trust, but you verify you do due diligence in your transaction. You start with the automatic assumption that the other party cannot be trusted and you therefore have to verify and check that what they say they're going to do, they're going to actually do. You need to not take their word for it, not believe them because they look trustworthy, but you go and check and make sure. So you spend a lot of time and effort um, doing that in order to ensure that it's going to work. Now, the intermediaries stand in the middle, but they have limitations as well. They're centralised. They can be hacked or they can fail. They slow things down. I mean, I've acted as an m and advisor for years. Transactions take six months. You know, the due diligence phase takes two to three months. The contracts take weeks and weeks because you're trying to account for every possibility that might go wrong and draw it up and negotiate it and, and document it. And it's, um, you know, a complete nightmare. So they slow things down, increasing settlement time, which, of course, vastly increase costs. You know, an M&A transaction can cost half a million dollars for not a very big transaction by the time you've got all the intermediaries in it. You know, VCs will provide capital to you, but they'll charge you 2% and they take a carried interest. So the cost can be enormous. And of course, there's a large part of the population in the world, and we're talking about a couple of billion people who don't even have access to the basics. And therefore, 
they're not even part of the economy. So how do we do business? Well, we um, often rely on personal interaction, informal rules. You know, we have this, this thing called money, which we, we trust in the money, but it's only a piece of paper. We have formal institutions who uh, help to give the system credibility and you know, systematically handle the transactions. We have online institutions like marketplaces. And if you think about eBay, eBay and um, Amazon, it's all about building trust. If I say I'm going to sell you something on eBay, eBay is creating the trust and the credibility that enables that transaction to happen. If I say I'm going to offer you a service on Fiverr, you put your money into Fiverr. Well, I can't take it out till I've delivered and you've confirmed you've got it. Building trust. But you have these central marketplaces. And of course, that involves time and that involves cost. So this is all summed up by a crisis of legitimacy. We just don't trust each other. And we can't do business unless we trust each other. And this is the, the critical issue. And with things getting more and more difficult and with all the fake news around, you know, trust is getting more and more difficult to create. And there's less and less of it about, if you like. So can we lower uncertainty and increase trust with technology? That is the critical question. And the answer is, well, maybe. If you think back over history, the printing press came in and uh, closed the knowledge gap. So the people who had control of the knowledge, which are fundamentally uh, in Western Europe, it was the church. When the printing press printed the Bible, and not only that, but printed the Bible in English or in German or in French. It meant that everyday people who could read, and there was still a limited number of those, suddenly had access to the information. The internal combustion engine on the steam engine created um, an opportunity to close the power gap. People in the fields were toiling away, harvesting you know, people couldn't knit and weave very quickly, but the engines came in and multiplied the impact of productivity, creating the Industrial Revolution. The Internet has closed the distance gap. I've now got students all over the world in 188 countries, but it also closed the information gap, making information much, much more available. So blockchain, and this is really the first time we've mentioned it, has the potential to close the trust gap. Maybe it does. Blockchain is arguably the second internet revolution, and it's all around this trust issue. But it's not the very fact that it can do something about trust, but it's what happens if you change the whole trust paradigm in the economy. Bettina Warburg put it very well in her TEDx talk. She said, how we exchange value, how we do it, will transform how we change value. If we can lower uncertainty about one another so that we can exchange value, we can trade. And that's been the premise throughout history. And this is why blockchain has some real potential. So let's just stop for a moment and ask the simple question, what is blockchain? Now, without getting too drawn into the detail, blockchain technology is a decentralized database which stores a registry of assets and transactions across a peer-to-peer -peer network. I'm going to try and keep it really simple. To be absolutely honest, I don't understand the really complex sides of cryptography and algorithms and all this sort of stuff. So you have a blockchain ledger, and the blockchain ledger records, it's, public, it's a public registry of who owns what and who transacts what. But every, unique, every record has a unique key with it. Every record is, is written and time-stamped. And every... Uh, record is secured with cryptography and then gets locked and joined together. So suddenly you have this, this record which uh, is unique, it's cryptographically, it, cryptographically is what I'm trying to say, um, uh, um, secured, it's time stamped uh, and then it's all locked together. But Every record is built on the previous record, including the timestamp and the cryptography from the previous record, uh, creating dependency between records. 
chaining the records together while you've got block and chain. They chain the records together. This means that it's impossible to change it because any change is immediately detected and any change below automatically um, is, is would have to be changed through every single record in the block everywhere. It's very difficult to, to effectively mess with it and get away with it. You can mess with it, but you're going to get caught out straight away because your record won't match up with every else re other record that's out there. So your record becomes immu uh, immutable, unchangeable, and unforgeable. But it's better than that because every record is replicated on every computer that uses that network. So communities all have their own blockchain and each participant, in order to participate, has a copy of the whole ledger. And this means that computers can compare the ledgers from one and recognize if even one of them has had even a small detail of the record changed because everybody else's records will show A and this one will show B. So you then get an immutable lever ledger that's distributed. And the consequence of that is that you begin to have something that you can trust. So what are the key trust issues we're struggling with? Well, not knowing who we're dealing with. Getting visibility into the transaction, asset tracking. Having recourse if something goes wrong. We've talked about these. Nodes in the network, in the blockchain network, don't need to trust each other. They don't need a third party to verify because they can independently reference all the truths for themselves. They can collaborate with and exchange with more trust and less friction. If you know that every record on the blockchain is the same as everybody else's record and you can't change it and you can't forge it, then you can trust it. Ah, we've got this magic word trust. So information on a blockchain can be trusted and is available in real time. Now this has enormous impacts for transactions because it affects timing. It affects the speed of the transaction. It affects the friction between the counterparties. It prevents fraud. It reduces cost to next to nothing. It makes the transactions highly efficient. So if transactions can settle instantly, you have no settlement risk. If it takes no time to settle a transaction, you don't have to worry about the other side. You have no counterparty risk. You don't need third parties to settle the transactions because the blockchain does it instantly and immutably. So costs are reduced to next to nothing and they disintermediate the intermediaries. They replace the need for intermediaries. Trust, that funny thing, trust, is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. But we know they won't in most cases. But what if you can program that into the very fabric of the economy? Well, you can using block blockchain technology. And that's why blockchain solves the trust problem. This is a long way to explain the connection between blockchain, its potential impact and trust. But if you take it as read, if you accept that trust is at the heart of the economy, if you trust that trust itself is the beating heart of capitalism and that blockchain can enable you to transact and trust at the same time, then blockchain truly solves the trust problem.